The Tesla Model S was one of Tesla's most important cars when it released all the way back in 2012. So much has changed for this car that it is hardly recognizable in regards to features, but when you look at the outside, it still looks fairly similar. After the popularity of the Model 3 and Model Y, the interior design for the Model S was looking and feeling especially dated. So all the way back in January of this year, Tesla finally announced the refresh of this car with their new impressive Plaid model releasing soon. Due to many factors, including parts shortages, it took a while for this car to truly launch, but now it's finally becoming widely available in both the normal long range and insanely fast Plaid models. The notable aspect about the Plaid Model S is that it is the quickest production car ever with a 0 to 60 in 1.99 seconds in the right circumstances. That means that there is literally no other stock car you can buy that will accelerate faster, and it's incredible to experience. The normal long range Model S is largely the same car as the Plaid model and still does a 3.1 second 0 to 60 with both models getting close to or above 400 miles of range on the EPA standard. I just picked up the new Plaid Model S a little over a week ago and have already driven over 1100 miles in the car, so today we're going to do a full review of the good and bad of the all new 2021 or 2022 Tesla Model S, so let's get into it. Before we get into it, I'd just like to thank everyone who has supported this channel over the past few years for making it possible to even buy this insane car. I really appreciate the support and plan to absolutely utilize this car on the channel and other ways to ensure that it goes to great use. I never imagined that I'd run a YouTube channel that gets to own the quickest accelerating car in the world and Tesla's flagship vehicle, but it has happened and it's incredibly fun. Make sure you subscribe for lots more videos about that car and let's get into the review. From the outside, as is often the case with Tesla's vehicles, it's hard to truly tell that the refreshed Model S is different than previous years. I went with blue and Tesla sells five different colors for the exterior paint. Overall, it looks the same as previous years, but you can tell that the rear is a bit wider, rear tires are a bit wider, and it has a more aggressive stance than previous years. Another way to tell this apart from other years Model S's is the gloss black trim all around the vehicle as opposed to chrome. This finished off Tesla's lineup so that they no longer ship cars with any chrome trim, and I'm a fan of it. The last way to tell it's a refreshed Model S is with the wheels. The 21 inch arachnid wheels seem to be the most popular, but I actually went with the 19 inch Tempest wheels that feature new darker hubcaps. Some people argue that with a car this expensive, you should get the best looking wheels. But when I bought my Model Y, I noticed a huge ride quality improvement when I switched to smaller wheels. Even though the Plaid Model S is a wild car with the speed that goes way beyond practicality, I still opted for the wheels that make the most sense for me, the Tempest wheels, and I'm happy that I did. The 19 inch Tempest wheels get an EPA range of 405 or 396 miles depending on your spec compared to the 21 inch arachnid wheels which drop up to 48 miles to 375 or 348 miles of range depending on your spec. I've driven both and the ride quality is significantly better on the 19s. I'm less concerned about potholes, tires should be cheaper, the wheels are $4,500 cheaper, and from what I've heard they perform about the same. That's why I went with those wheels but again if you're trying to spot this new car you'll see the dark hubcaps or the 21 inch arachnid wheels. Wheels. One more exterior feature to note is the all glass panoramic roof which provides great views from the inside of this car, but that has been there for a while on this car. Even though it's an incredible performing car, the Model S is a full-fledged hatchback sedan. It has four doors and a very spacious trunk. The automatic hatch opens up to reveal a large trunk space. You have a side cubby and an under storage compartment as well. That under storage comes in especially handy for anything that may move around or make noise when driving. Then the Model S has a cargo cover to cover up anything stored in your trunk and this is easily removable for when you want to fold the seats down. The rear seats fold down with buttons on the seats or in the rear but still require you to push them down. They fold mostly flat and allow for a full pass through of cargo when needed. I have already fit drums in here without issue so there is a lot of room. The front trunk isn't too spacious due to the intense motors included in this car but it does add extra space when necessary. Just be sure to close it gently and not like a typical car hood. When going inside the Model S features the same style door handle that it has for years. They retract into the car and remain flush. Then when you walk up to the car with your key, they pop out for you and open up. Some people have complained of issues with this over the years, but I actually haven't experienced any issues on this new model yet. If they don't open automatically, usually you just press them and then they retract as long as your key is connected. When you go inside, you'll see five seats, two in front and three in the rear. I went with the black interior with wood accents for this car, but Tesla sells a few different options like white, cream, and carbon fiber accents. In my opinion, white interior actually looks the best on this car, but it arguably will take a bit more maintenance, though not much more. 
The interior has an improved look all around, taking design cues from the Model 3 and Y, and overall feels more sturdy than previous Model S builds. The wood trim in the doors looks great in my opinion, but still, if you're comparing price point and interior stylings only, Tesla will probably get beat here, but stay tuned. The front seats are very comfortable with standard adjustment options and lumbar support in both driver and passenger seats. The biggest upgrade here is that in addition to being heated, they are ventilated, and this is fantastic to have in areas where it gets hot. I've noticed that I can pump the AC a little less since my seats are keeping my back and legs nice and cool. The rear seats have the same pattern to them, but they actually are not ventilated. There are the two rear side seats and the center seat, which folds down for a cup holder and a wireless charger. This seat isn't super comfortable since it kind of bulges out where that fold down cup holder and charger is, but it does exist and function. Up front is the center console, which is actually very functional. You have the main large area with two areas that slide out for storage and cup holders. It's really versatile and lets you store a number of different things. Above that is a wireless charger for two smartphones. Then the armrest has storage underneath it as well. The doors have pockets for water and other miscellaneous things, and the glove box opens from the touchscreen and has a little bit of storage as well. Next comes the biggest part of this refresh, the cockpit view and general clean front interior. From the driving position, this is your view, and it is a huge improvement over previous Model S's in my experience so far. The center screen is now a beautiful horizontal 17-inch display that is the most responsive and clear screen I've seen in a Tesla thus far. Everything is much quicker, and the new UI works very well. Even the rear camera when backing up looks much more clear than before, and that's thanks to the resolution of the screen. There are no vents anywhere in this car since it takes the invisible AC system from the Model 3 and Y. This adds to the clean look of the dash and works very well controlled on screen. Rear passengers can do the same, controlling their climate on screen as well. Your AC settings are saved in your profile, so as cool as the visualization is, I actually rarely use it and just adjust my auto temperature. One extra cool feature here is what Tesla calls bioweapon defense mode. Essentially, this is a very large HEPA filter that can truly clean the cabin air to another level when needed. It's great to have during wildfires or anytime there is extremely unhealthy air. I just drove up California on the 5 and turned it on anytime I was passing the stinkiest cow areas and it worked like a charm so I didn't smell it a single bit. The instrument cluster is right above the steering yoke and provides all of your relevant driving information like speed, autopilot visualizations, next navigation step, and more. These two screens work great together and it's the best implementation of screens I've seen from any car yet. The instrument cluster is clearly and fully in view because the steering wheel is not a normal wheel, it's a steering yoke, which is the most controversial and noticeable part of this car. Tesla unveiled the yoke back in January and at the time there were rumors that they would make a normal wheel option as well. Surely this crazy looking race wheel can't be the only option. Maybe it's only for the Plaid model? Nope, this yoke is the only option for the Model S and upcoming Model X refresh, regardless of your configuration. Tesla sells two options for the Model S, the long range model starting at $90,000 and the Plaid model starting at $130,000. Overall, 99% of these cars are the same, so everything I review here besides performance will be exactly the same for both cars, even the yoke. Now, the yoke is a two-parter in regards to change. First is obviously the shape. Steering ratio is the same as before, so when you do larger turns, you do have to flip this thing over and it can be a bit awkward at first. I'll give more details about that in a minute. The second part is that Tesla got rid of stocks entirely on this wheel. All of your controls for blinkers, headlights, horn, windshield wipers, and autopilot have been mapped to touch sensitive buttons or the scroll wheels around the yoke. Then shifting has been moved to an automatic feature called auto shift out of park or the shifter placed on the left side of the screen. Now first, auto wipers and auto headlights make those particular controls something you rarely need to touch, but blinkers are something you are hopefully using all the time. In my experience so far, all but one of these controls works just fine. It's not better, but it's also not worse, and I'm already used to it in a little over a week. There have been many judgment calls about this wheel and tons of headlines calling it the dumbest decision Tesla has made, but most of these people have either gone into it with their conclusion drawn or haven't used the wheel much. Some have never even seen it in person. After using this for over 1100 miles, I've come to the conclusion that I don't really want to hear your opinion on it unless you've used it for an entire week. Everybody has decades 
decades of muscle memory with a round wheel. So the yoke is inevitably going to feel weird at first, regardless of whether you want to like it or not. The first few turns over 90 degrees will be super weird. The first time you have to shift using a touch screen will be super weird. The first time you have to use a touch sensitive button to turn on your turn signal will also be super weird. All of this though, and I mean all of this, I'm already used to and don't think twice about. Now I love the yoke and actually prefer driving with it. I own a Model Y and driving that now just makes me want to drive the yoke again. No joke. I was a huge critic of this wheel at first and now I get it. Tesla sells experiences and it's something that you can't just write on a features list. You can't write down the feature of how smooth accelerating in an electric car is. You just have to experience it to really understand it. Similarly, you also can't write down how fun it is to take a curve with the yoke. It's one of those things you just have to try out for some time to truly understand and it's very easy to make it look stupid for headlines. Here, this is my attempt to make the yoke look like it's impossible to drive and it's the dumbest design decision ever. I'll take a few turns, turn around, and more, making this thing look really hard to drive. Ah. So that's how some reviewers like to showcase the yoke. Not only am I using the round wheel muscle memory, but I'm driving in the worst possible conditions for the yoke. All of the corner cases where the yoke looks awkward, even though about 95% of the time when driving, you'll never be turning the wheel past 90 degrees. Now I'll do the same route as someone who actually has used this new type of wheel and understands how to use it. As you can see, once you give it a chance, the yoke isn't difficult to use. Additionally, that route is corner cases for where the yoke differs a lot from a round wheel. Then for 95% of driving, it's awesome and way better. It feels like a little spaceship and actually puts your arms in the safest driving position and your shoulders in good driving posture. Call me Ryan the Yoke Apologist all you want, but give it a real try before writing it off if you're genuinely interested in this new Model S. In any case, those controls are there and then the left scroll wheel is dedicated to media controls, just like the Model three and Y. Scrolling up turns up or down, clicking left or right skips tracks, and then pressing the scroll wheel pauses or plays. The right scroll wheel is dedicated to autopilot with a press initiating autopilot, scrolling up and down controlling set speed, and clicking left or right controlling following distance. Although oddly, the following distance adjustment is not activated yet and should come in a future software update. You have to adjust that in settings instead right now. Now, the one feature that seems super weird to me on this wheel is the horn placement. Instead of a normal horn, Tesla has moved moved the horn to a touch sensitive button. I've already had two instances where I needed to hit the horn, hit the center of the yoke to no avail, and then had to touch this tiny little touch button. Maybe there is a safety advantage to this and airbag sensitivity for not smashing the center of the yoke when honking, but I really don't know. Apparently you can honk by covering all the buttons on the right side of the yoke, essentially replacing a horn smash in the center of the wheel with a horn smash to the right of the wheel, but I haven't successfully activated this in all of my attempts. That's a muscle memory I don't really want to relearn, but I'm going to have to with this car. Next, let's talk about the build of the Model S, and then we'll talk about performance and general features. Tesla has struggled with build quality issues from the beginning. These are mostly fit and finish issues where things are misaligned on the car and don't really affect driving, but affect your feeling of whether your premium priced car delivers premium quality. I usually see both sides of these issues. For one, if the Model S starts at $90,000, there should not be a single fit and finish issue delivered with the car. On the other hand, if you really want this car, there isn't really a great alternative truly available for purchase, so if you can get past those small issues and get them fixed by Tesla after delivery, it can be worth it. We don't want Tesla to think that these issues are fine and everyone will buy them regardless, but we also know that they're the newest car company and these things will improve over time as they expand to more newer factories. I purchased the Plaid Model S, which again comes in at $130,000, so that shouldn't have issues. Overall, my car is great. Door alignments, trim, hatches, nearly everything looks great, and works as expected. When I drive, I have yet to hear any rattles or squeaks, and the interior is incredibly quiet. The Model S refresh is early in production, so we'll probably see more issues than we will in a year from now, but it's still far better than the condition my Model Y came in when I bought that early in production in March of 2020. It's still not perfect though. The first thing I noticed was that one of the door handles was set in quite a bit further than the others. This is something I've seen on a number of Teslas over the years, but expected to be fixed by now. At the delivery center in Carlsbad, I noticed a few things and then had a couple things fixed before leaving. I will note that they were very nice and helpful there and weren't just trying to get me out the door with the car. One issue was the wood trim next to the rear seat, which was loose. I could actually see a little under it and they fixed that before I left. The next thing I noticed is something I didn't mention because these cars 
cars are hard to get right now, and fixing this probably would result in a huge delay. There are wrinkles in the stitching of the rear center seat. Likely this is a problem for whoever makes these seats, but still, a wrinkle in the seat of a brand new $130,000 car. I didn't say anything because the next time I will personally pay attention to it is the next time I make a review video, and I plan to fold these seats down quite a bit for cargo. Around the car, the trim just doesn't sit perfectly. The Model S has had trim issues like this for a while, and they still haven't changed, so there are random little folds in the trim, and parts where it just doesn't quite fit right. Then the last and biggest issue was something that they luckily pointed out to me after fixing the trim issue, a dent in the front bumper. This dent looks like it honestly occurred before it was painted and made it all the way to me. They initiated a due bill for the bumper, meaning that Tesla will replace the bumper entirely for me, at no charge as they should, but of course it's a brand new car so that part is delayed. All will be made right, which is good, and these trim issues will all be fixed, but it would be far better if none of this made it to the customer. I already got front PPF on the car, so I had them skip the bumper, then I'll go to a service appointment, get a new bumper, and then bring it back in for PPF on the bumper. It just takes up my time instead of Tesla's time fixing these issues on their end. Now I'm having a new issue where the trim is kind of detaching on the driver's side door and actually results in the sticky residue sticking to the window so that I hear it detach every time I open the door. It's also sticking to and removing the window tint I just had put on. A new issue I've noticed is something we noticed at delivery, but it fixed itself and now it's happening about half the time where the mirrors actually unfold past where they should. When I get in the car, the right mirror will unfold past where it's supposed to, and this results in the mirror looking way too far to the right, and no matter how I adjust it on screen, I just can't use it that way. I can manually pop it back into place, but no matter what, this happens about half the time. Lastly, the center console armrest is a bit creaky when I put any weight on it. These things are 100% my biggest criticism of Tesla as a company, and I will only stop talking about them when I get a car delivered in the condition it should be for the price tag. With that said, the reason I still buy a Tesla is because for me, and many others, everything else makes up for these issues. The Model S includes two key fobs, two key cards, and the phone as key functionality. Now that Tesla has updated their app, all of these options work very well. With your phone or key fob, you walk up to the car, it unlocks on approach, and locks as you walk away automatically. You never have to worry about locking the car, and it's very useful. It's fully electric, so you don't have to turn on the car. You just get in and start going. Driver profiles are saved on screen, and you have the option for easy entry, which I use in this car. When I enter, the seat is pushed back and wheel pushed forward, and it's very easy to get in. Then when I buckle up or press the brake, everything sets to my position, including seats, wheel placement, mirror adjustments, AC settings, and general on-screen settings. For an example, there my wife sits quite a bit differently than me and also doesn't like driving in plaid mode so the car sets all of that when she enters on the driver's side. You can also change profiles on screen and update them easily at any time. Once you're set you press the brake and the Model S will guess the direction you are wanting to go based on the cameras around the vehicle. So far this is guessed correctly every time for me and the only time I shift on screen is when I'm doing some sort of three-point turn or shifting to reverse into a parking spot. You shift on screen as the first option and then if for whatever reason the screen were to fail, there is a backup option located at the base of the center console wireless charger. These require multiple presses to bring up and are not illuminated or available until you do, so you'll never accidentally press them. The Tesla app includes many great features like warming up or cooling down the car remotely via the climate controls on screen, locking or unlocking the car, opening or closing the trunk, opening the frunk, starting the car, initiating home link, flashing the lights, checking the car's location, summoning the car if you have that upgrade, turning on sentry mode or valet mode, and venting the windows when necessary. The new Model S features three screens. There are two up front that I mentioned, as well as a new rear screen for rear passengers. Right now, this rear screen allows you to control media, watch Netflix, Hulu, Disney+, and more while driving, and soon will add support for gaming as well via software updates. Again, in case you heard that wrong, that's for the rear screen that you can use those features when driving. You can't do that while driving on the front screen, of course. Since these cars are run mostly on screens, software is the most important part about them, and Tesla brings out software updates all the time to fix bugs, improve things in the car, and bring brand new features. I just mentioned Disney Plus support, and that's something that every Tesla now includes, even those who bought the car before Disney Plus existed. So your car will always stay up to date and be improved throughout ownership. 
When driving, this is your view. The instrument cluster gives you your most relevant information like speed limit, current speed, autopilot set speed, autopilot visualizations, and next navigation step. Then the main screen has a few different options. By default, you have maps, which is by far the best, most useful, and largest maps I've ever seen in a car. You can have this full screen, but you can also bring up music controls and work with both of those at the same time, adjusting their sizes based on what you prefer. The new interface works a lot like an iPad UI, so you can shift windows around, change window sizing, and more, usually between these two apps as the driver. The dock gives the most relevant controls like climate, cameras, Spotify, volume controls, and more, and these can actually be customized to exactly what you need. I put the phone icon right next to Spotify, which makes it easy switching between those two audio sources, and if you use SiriusXM or other sources, you can put those there for your liking. The main controls and settings are accessed with the button in the bottom right, or by swiping in from the left side of the screen. First is the quick control for opening up the trunk or frunk, locking, adjusting mirrors, steering or wipers, window lock, and more like sentry mode, neutral, screen brightness, and dash cam clip saving. Raised suspension is a quick control and this comes in very handy when driving into steep driveways or anything that could cause the car to bottom out. You press that button, it raises, and it allows you to save that location to automatically raise next time. Then you have all of your settings for driving modes, steering modes, and suspension. Suspension settings are very intuitive and awesome to have, allowing you to choose between comfort, auto, sport, or advanced, which is a customizable mode. You can adjust dampening settings and ride height very specifically, and the car will automatically raise the suspension when needed on bumpier roads. Multiple times throughout a drive, if you have comfort or auto on, you'll see a pop-up for raising suspension to improve ride quality, and it really makes a big difference. Passengers can use the screen as well to choose different things, play with certain functions, or even play games like solitaire while you drive, since your relevant information remains on the left side and instrument cluster. Then there are charging options, autopilot options, lock options, lights, display, trips, navigation, safety, service, and software. As you can see, the only real adjustments you'll need to access when driving are on the quick controls screen and are still rarely needed. The sound system in this new Model S is absolutely incredible. It's a 22 speaker, 960 watt system that is the best system I've ever heard in a car. My previous favorite was the Model Y and this takes it to another level. There are many options on screen for the sound system and the newest options, just added in a software update, allow you to tune your immersive sound settings and specifically turn up the subs separate from the bass frequencies for EQ. The sound system really shines because of how quiet the interior is in this car. Thanks to new Tesla glass advancements, it's one of the quietest cabins I've ever been in, even on freeways, and is light years better than the interior cabin noise in my older Model Y. So there's that along with the air suspension and 19 inch wheels helping with road noise, but active noise canceling is another feature promised in this car that should be arriving soon. I can't imagine it getting much quieter, but that will be coming soon in software and I'm excited for it because the hardware is already in the seats. You really get to hear how great the sound system is even when driving because it's so quiet inside. That sound system also gets featured with the various entertainment options included in the car for rear passengers when driving or front passengers when parked for charging or anything else. Included on screen is Netflix, Hulu, YouTube, Twitch, and Disney+. These apps aren't the quickest, but once you select your show, it's good to go and taking full advantage of the 17 inch screen and amazing sound system. There are also a slew of games included and this new Model S features a huge upgrade in that department. Quote, up to 10 teraflops of processing power enables in-car gaming on par with today's newest consoles. Wireless controller compatibility lets you game from any seat. This render here shows two things that haven't arrived in this car in software yet, but should come soon. Witcher is a AAA game that this car can run, but hasn't been given to customers yet. And rear screen gaming is demoed here but also has yet to ship in software. Hopefully these along with noise canceling come very soon since they've been promised from the beginning. So those are most of the on-screen features, but we haven't even driven the car yet. To drive the car, you press the brake, it guesses your direction based on the autopilot cameras and you're off. Since this car is fully electric, it has instant torque and regenerative braking, both incredible features that make the driving experience incredibly smooth. This also enables one pedal driving since it starts braking when you let off the accelerator. It takes a little time to get used to, but once you do, it's a much more comfortable way to drive. With the normal long range Model Y, you'll still have crazy fast specs up to a 3.1 second zero to 60 of power to draw from at any time. This, however, is the Plaid model, which as mentioned earlier, is the quickest production vehicle ever. That means that the zero to 60 quite literally feels like a stomach dropping roller coaster, and that speed and power is available at any time and at any speed thanks to the crazy power curve of the tri-motor system. This much power is definitely not necessary for most people. The long range model 
has plenty of power, still can drop your stomach if you want, and comes in $40,000 cheaper. However, for those who want this speed, the Plaid definitely does not disappoint. Here are some launch reactions I did in a previous video. I had told everyone how powerful the car was, but most weren't ready. It's incredibly fun and shocking just how fast this car is. However, speed isn't the only aspect of driving. This car handles very well, especially for a vehicle its size, and the yoke makes it incredibly fun. In fact, Tesla just beat the electric vehicle record at the legendary Nürburgring track with this same stock car and the yoke. Then, if you don't care about speed and performance, it's just a great daily driver. I just drove from Los Angeles to San Francisco and then back two days later, and it was an amazing ride. Ride quality is great, cabin noise is great, the sound system is great, ventilated seats are great, and then autopilot is great. The Model S features eight cameras all around the exterior of the car, all of which contribute to Tesla's well-known autopilot system. The stock features of this system are traffic-aware cruise control and auto steer. That means that without buying any upgrades in this area, the car will do lane keeping incredibly well, keeping proper distance from the car in front of you, slowing down and speeding up as necessary, and steering to keep you centered in the lane. I use this for about 90% of those drives to and from San Francisco this past weekend. If you just want cruise control and want to steer for yourself, you can choose the setting that requires two presses to enter autopilot. With this setting enabled, you press once on the scroll wheel and you'll be in cruise control only. For auto steer, you press twice on that scroll wheel. For me personally though, if I'm using cruise control, I want the car to steer for me as well, so I choose the single click option in settings. One press on the scroll wheel, the car chimes to let me know it's driving and I'm good to go. It makes long drives a lot less taxing and you just need to be there paying attention to ensure the car is doing well and paying attention to take over if necessary. To take over, you either press the scroll wheel again to exit autopilot or press the brake or just steer out of autopilot. I usually use this system anytime the road is fairly straightforward and take over when it gets extremely curvy, although it can handle a lot more situations than people expect. It might be the shape of this car, but it takes turns a lot better than my Model Y and rides in the center of the lane much more consistently than that car, even though it's the same system. In the Model S, it works incredibly well overall and I use it all of the time. Just remember to pay attention since it is not perfect. Now, if you want more self-driving features, Tesla does sell their full self-driving package for $10,000 or $199 per month. This package includes Navigate on Autopilot, which will change lanes for you and make freeway interchanges, Auto Lane Change, which changes lanes for you after you initiate on the blinker, Auto Park, which parks in parallel or normal spots for you, Summon, where the car will come to you in a parking lot, Traffic Light and Stop Sign Control, where the car will stop at stop signs and traffic lights, and drive for you to a degree on city streets, and the future feature of auto steer on city streets, which Tesla has been demoing in beta for some time now. In my opinion, this package isn't worth the high cost. I've had it for some time now on my Model Y and really only use auto lane change initiated by myself. Everything else is still in beta and not super useful, but buying the package does ensure that you'll get the future software updates for auto steer on city streets and any future self-driving features Tesla develops. I personally did the subscription for now on this Model S to have auto lane change on my road trip, and I'll see if I end up keeping it or not. Unfortunately, buying the package means that it stays with the vehicle, so if you sell or trade in, that FSD upgrade goes with the car and often doesn't get valued in the sale or trade in. Then you have to buy it again on your new car. Luckily, these features can be added after delivery through the Tesla app, whether you pay in full for $10,000 or monthly for $199. So I always recommend getting the car with standard autopilot and then making your decision after experiencing how much basic autopilot can already do for you. Since the car includes all of those cameras, there are a couple other features that are much improved. For one, when reversing, your backup camera is the best backup camera available in a car. It's huge and super easy to see, and then your two side cameras are included as well, giving you way more visibility than the wide angle rear camera. Additionally, for security, Tesla includes a flash drive in the glove box that saves dash cam and sentry mode footage. Dash cam is exactly what it sounds like, a dash cam that records with four cameras while driving. They are always recording and rewriting, and then if an event happens, like an accident, the footage is saved automatically. This comes in especially handy in an accident. Sentry mode is the same system, but when you are away from your car. The cameras activate with motion near your car, record what happens near your car, and warns passerbyers on the screen 
that the security system is in use. There have been many instances of people damaging a Tesla or trying to break in that have been saved or solved with this security footage. One last small feature that I forgot to mention is Homelink, which is the automatic garage door opener that opens and closes based on your location. With either spec of Model S, range will be plenty for your needs, but keep in mind that EPA range is different than real world range, especially if you like taking advantage of the performance included in these cars. When I drove from San Francisco back to LA, I still had to stop once to charge because my trip was about 390 miles and I wasn't driving perfectly efficient at 65 miles per hour like the EPA thinks I might want to do. So I stopped once at a supercharger. I had to use the bathroom and eat some food, so I stopped at one of Tesla's over 25,000 supercharger stalls and it worked out more than perfectly. The new Model S charges the fastest of any Tesla thus far, so by the time I got food, my car already had more than enough range that I needed to complete my journey. With both specs of this car getting close to 400 miles of range EPA, I think you'll find that you never need to worry about it. In daily driving, you're never driving that much and you can charge up at home overnight like I do. Then on a road trip, you just stop at a charger while you use the restroom and eat. It's incredibly easy and this car in particular shows how great it can be. The only time driving this Model S would actually add time to your journey is if you can't find a charger on your normal route, or if you're driving something over a thousand miles in a day. To be honest, I never thought I'd be a fan of the Model S. I always preferred the Model 3 and Y for their stylings, and the Model S felt a bit dated, especially in the interior. I wanted Tesla to change the exterior of the Model S in a noticeable way this time around as well, but with its 0.208 drag coefficient, it's the lowest drag car on Earth, and I don't see any reason Tesla would want to mess with that. The new interior is exactly the upgrade I was hoping for, and the new UI, screen resolution, and even yoke makes this car an incredibly user-friendly, seamless experience. After completing that road trip, I realized that there wasn't much I could see improving in my experience I had driving. The car drove for me a lot of the trip, it was smooth, quiet, and I listened to music on an amazing sound system. I stopped once to charge and didn't have to wait any time past what I would have already stopped to eat and use the restroom. Tesla is selling experiences, and you can't truly understand this car until until you experience it for yourself. I think the new Model S is exactly the upgrade Tesla needed to revitalize this car, and it has completely converted me. Someone who thought the Model S was dated and the yoke was a joke, to someone who bought this car and can't wait to drive it again. If you're shopping for a car in that price range, I would definitely check it out and try to experience the car for a few days to truly understand. As I said earlier, thanks so much to everyone who has supported this channel and made this review possible, and in the meantime, if you want to see the newest features Tesla just brought out for this car, you can check out that video linked up here or in the description below. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you on the next one.